Hello there, AP Environmental Science class. Welcome to part one of my lecture on chapter six, aquatic biodiversity. So in chapter five, we talked about uh, terrestrial biodiversity. Now we're gonna head out into the waters uh, and talk about that aquatic biodiversity, both in a freshwater and in, in, in saltwater ecosystem. So uh, we start off with a core case study. Why should we care about coral reefs? Coral reefs are among the world's oldest, most diverse, and most productive ecosystems. They form in clear, warm coastal waters in tropical areas. Tiny animals called polyps and single-celled algae live together in a mutualistic relationship. Uh, the polyps secrete calcium carbonate shells, which become the coral reef. But what we're finding out is that, unfortunately, uh, because of uh, the warming of the ocean uh, uh, and the increase in, in, in carbon that is being uh, put into the ocean as well, because of the extra carbon uh, that is uh, in our atmosphere, that unfortunately uh, these coral reefs are beginning to die out. But they provide important ecological and, e and economic services. They're natural barriers that protect coastlines from flooding during storms. Uh, coral reefs uh, produce habitat, food, and or spawning grounds for about one quarter to one third of the ocean's organisms. Uh, but they are vulnerable to damage. Again, soil runoff uh, can damage them. Climate change, which increases the ocean temperature and again that uh, increasing ocean acidity we talked about as well uh, can uh, damage uh, these coral reefs and unfortunately this is what we're seeing now in a lot of the coral reefs around the world this is a bleached coral reef so again you'll notice the white here uh, this means the coral is dead um, and again, this bleaching is a result of the warming oceans and the uh, increasing acidity uh, in the oceans as well, all because, all because of the uh, excess uh, carbon, especially, that we are putting into our atmosphere. So this is why we care about coral reefs. Again, very important. And unfortunately, uh, we're seeing a lot of them uh, becoming bleached out uh, throughout the world. So. What is the general nature of aquatic systems? Well, we have two types of aquatic systems, basically saltwater and freshwater. Uh, though saltwater and freshwater aquatic life zones cover almost three fourths or 75% of Earth's surface. Factors that determine aquatic biodiversity is going to be the temperature of the water, the dissolved oxygen content or the DO of the water, the availability of food in that water's ecosystem, and the access to light and nutrients necessary for photosynthesis. These are going to be the factors that will affect the biodiversity uh, in an aquatic ecosystem. So once again, saltwater covers about 71% of Earth's surface. Uh, Freshwater occupies another 2%. The global ocean divided into five areas. It really is one big global ocean, uh, but we know it more as the Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, the Arctic Ocean, the Indian Ocean, and the huge Southern Ocean that basically uh, goes around Antarctica. So again, five uh, zones of our oceans. Uh, distribution of organisms determined largely by salinity or how much salt is in the water, right? So we have our saltwater life zone. Zones. These are also called marine life zones, and they're going to be oceans, estuaries, coasts, coral reefs, and mangrove forests, uh, just to name a few. And then we have our freshwater life zones, right, where water doesn't have the salt in it. That's going to be your lakes, your rivers, your streams, and your inland wetlands. So uh, let's talk about how species uh, deal with themselves in the water. They're going to either drift, swim, crawl, or cling. Those are the four ways uh, that most of our uh, ocean-dwelling organisms get around. So first, we're going to talk about plankton. Plankton are drifting drifting organisms. We have a couple of different types of plankton you need to know about. First one is cytoplankton. These are the primary producers for most, uh, most aquatic food webs. Then we have something called ultraplankton, which are tiny photosynthetic bacteria. And then we have something called zooplankton, which are actually secondary consumers, uh, and they can range from single cell to large invertebrates like jellyfish. So jellyfish are considered zooplankton. You'll notice a jellyfish here on the left the man of war. Uh, and on the right, you have something known as a starfish or a sea star because it is definitely not a fish. Again, these are those uh, examples of that zooplankton. We then have something called nectin. Nectin are organisms in the ocean or the uh, or, or a freshwater ecosystem that are strong swimmers. So fish, 
turtles, whales, things like that are grouped into the nectin uh, category. Then we have something called benthos. Those are your bottom dwellers. They're going to live on the bottom of your aquatic ecosystems like oysters, sea stars, clams, lobsters, and crabs. And then you're going to have the decomposers. Uh, these are mostly bacteria that are obviously going to decompose any organisms uh, that have uh, died and fallen uh, to the bottom of the ocean. Uh, key factors in the type and number of organisms that you're going to see, again, talking about it once again, are the temperature of the ocean or the freshwater lake or river or swamp, uh, how much dissolved oxygen is there. Um, again, we need a lot more dissolved oxy oxygen for bigger uh, aquatic creatures, less dissolved oxygen for smaller creatures, uh, the avail av availability of food, obviously, and of course, the availability of light and nutrients needed for that photosynthesis. In addition, turbidity of the water is going to be important as well. Uh, turbidity is the degree of cloudiness in the water, obviously more turbidity. Uh, you're not going to have that available light for photosynthesis, all right? So we're going to look at that as well. Again, these are the key factors in the types and numbers of organisms, basically the biodiversity uh, that you're going to see in an aquatic ecosystem. So first, we're going to head out into the oceans, all right? We'll talk about um, marine aquatic systems first, and then we'll uh, talk more about freshwater uh, aquatic systems. I believe the freshwater uh, will come mostly in part two of this lecture. So we're going to talk about the marine or the ocean aquatic systems right now. So again, marine or ocean aquatic systems are going to be saltwater ecosystems because they have salt uh, as part of the water, right? Uh, they provide major ecosystem and economic services, and they are irreplaceable reservoirs of biodiversity. So the oceans, again, provide these vital ecosystems and economic services for us. Oceans produce more than half of the oxygen we breathe. In addition, the oceans provide most of the rain that sustains the water supply or the hydrologic cycle on land. Most of the rain that falls here in Ardsley or that falls on most of our terrestrial biomes actually come from the oceans or our aquatic biomes. That's where most of the rain comes from. Uh, we have 110 million tons of seafood on average harvested per year. You can imagine the, uh, the money all right, that, 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 that brings in the economic services. Uh, but the o Earth's oceans are poorly understood, right? They're a potential source of more ecological and economic benefits that we don't even know of yet. We always talk about how the bottoms of the oceans, uh, we know more about the moon than we know about the bottom uh, of the oceans here, here on planet Earth. So it's somewhere or an area that we are doing much more research for. So in the ocean, there are going to be three major life zones that you're going to need to know. The first one, is the coastal zone. Obviously, that's going to be near the coast, right? Uh, warm, nutrient-rich water that is usually shallow. This extends from the land, the coastline, all the way to the edge of the continental shelf. What's the continental shelf? That's when the that's pretty much the edge of the continent, and then it drops off into uh, into the abysmal plain, which is the uh, the bottom of the ocean. All right. So basically, the coastal zone is from the coast up through that uh, continental shelf. Makes up less than 10% of the world's ocean areas, but contains 90% of all marine species. You need to understand this. The open ocean does not have as much species as the ocean near the coastline. The ocean near the coastline, while making up only 10% of the world's ocean area, actually contain 90% of all the species that live in the ocean, basically near the coast. Then we have the open sea, and then we have the ocean bottom. Again, you're not going to see as much biodiversity in the open sea and the ocean bottom as you're going to see along the coastal zone. Uh, this is just some natural capital. Again, I really like these charts uh, in our book here. Um, basically, these are marine ecosystems. On the left, ecosystem services provided by the oceans. On the right, economic services. And again, you should know these uh, for potential multiple choice or free response questions. So ecosystem services, again, oxygen supplied through photosynthesis. We said about half of the oxygen that we breathe on Earth is coming from the oceans. Uh, water purification, climate moderate, moderation, right? If you're near, if you're near the ocean, uh, you don't really have huge swings in temperature from summer to winter. Uh, the oceans absorb or sequester carbon dioxide. We have nutrient cycle. We have reduced storm damage, mangroves, barrier islands, coastal wetlands, all right, uh, help 
the, uh, the coastal areas not get as much damage during storms. And of course, biodiversity, species and habitats, economic services from the ocean, food, energy from waves and tides. We're actually figuring out a way that you can actually produce energy uh, from incoming and outgoing tides, pharmaceuticals, harbors and transportation routes, right? Recreation and tourism. Who doesn't love going to the ocean? Uh, employment and minerals as well. So definitely understand uh, some of these ecosystem and economic services uh, that the ocean provides. Once again, here is the ocean kind of broken up. You'll notice here is that coastal zone from basically the coast all the way to the continental shelf. And then again, at the continental shelf is when we uh, drop down into that uh, abyssal zone, which is the basically bottom of the ocean, right? So most of your creatures, 90% live in the coastal zone. Then you have the open sea, okay? And then this uh, bathial zone and then the abyssal zone way down at the bottom. So again, understand these zones and what you're going to find in them. All right. We also have estuaries and coastal wetlands. So that pretty much talked about the ocean, guys. You have your three zones with most of your biodiversity in the coastal zone. Now we talk about these estuaries and coastal wetlands. They are areas that are kind of between, right, the ocean and then the freshwater that's kind of inland. These are kind of those in-between areas, right? So what are estuaries? Again, they're aquatic zones where rivers meet the sea. Coastal wetlands, a coastal land covered with water all or part of the year. These include your coastal marshes, salt marshes, and your mangrove forests. I'm going to show you some pictures of these uh, in just a second. Estuaries and coastal wetlands are very productive ecosystems with high nutrient level. If you remember from the last chapter, the NPP of these estuaries and coastal wetlands, very, very high, right? So they're very productive ecosystems. And that's why we're going to talk in a little bit about how we're destroying our estuaries. And when we destroy our estuaries and our coastal wetlands, we are destroying our biodiversity. We also have seagrass beds. Again, I'll show you a picture of what these are. Uh, these occur in shallow coastal waters. Uh, they hope, uh, host up to 60 species of grasses and plants, and they also support a variety of marine species. So first things first, uh, this, is the, uh, this is actually a sediment plume uh, from the mouth of of a, a river in Madagascar called the Betsaboka River. Um, and you'll notice all this sediment here flowing down the river and out into the out into the ocean here. Again, this sediment, not good for estuaries. Again, it's a form of pollution for the estuaries. This is a uh, coastal marsh. So this is what coastal coastal marshes look like. Uh, this is down in South Carolina. But if you go down the Jersey Shore or even to the southern shore of, of, of uh, Long Island, um, northern shore of Long Island as well, uh, you will see these a lot. So again, these are around this area. You'll see them. These are your coastal marshes. Um, these are your mangrove forests. These are actually uh, on the coast of Thailand. Uh, but I am one who uh, visits Florida a lot. And if you go kind kayaking in Florida, which I've done, uh, you'll get some of these uh, mangrove forests as well uh, in Florida. So again, I'm sure many of you have seen these. These are great uh, barriers. These mangrove forests protect uh, the, the inland areas from coastal storms. So when we get rid of these, uh, which they do in many countries to plant rice, well, unfortunately, not only are you losing your biodiversity, but you're also losing your protection from storms. These are your seagrass beds. Uh, this is one uh, off of San Clemente Island in California. Uh, I've done a bunch of snorkeling myself off of Santa Catalina Island off of the southern coast of California. Maybe you've been there. Uh, if you ever do get to uh, snorkel off of California's southern coast, you will see this all the time. And lots of fish, lots of marine species live in these seagrass beds. So again, very important, uh, these coastal wetlands, these coastal estuaries uh, to the biodiversity. And again, lots of economic and ecological services uh, that these coastal wetlands provide and these estuaries. All right, next uh, area we're going to talk about are the rocky and sandy shores that host different types of organisms. So this is your intertidal zone. This is your area of shore between high and low tide. And believe it or not, between high and low tide, you have different creatures that are living there uh, in their own ecological niche. And we'll talk about that in a second. Organisms must survive with daily salinity and moisture changes, right, in the tidal zone. Sometimes you have the water, right, salty, lots of water. And then when the tide goes out, not a lot of salt, it can get dry, right? We have rocky shores, which 
are pounded by waves. And then we have barrier beaches or sandy shores uh, where most organisms will burrow, dig, or tunnel in the sand. So what we're looking at here um, is, again, uh, living between the tides. These are your specialized niches. Here is a rocky shore beach. Here is a barrier beach, again, with sand. Uh, and you'll notice, what are we seeing? We're seeing different types of creatures living in different areas. So in the sandy beach, the barrier beach, high tide, you got these beagles, these fleas, that uh, beetles and fleas that live there, right? Um, then at low tide, you have some of these crabs that kind of come out of the water and the sandpiper there kind of eating stuff, right? And on the rocky shores, same type of thing. You have sea anemone, hermit crabs kind of kind of living in the high tide area. And then the low tide area, you have these flatworms and these sea urchins, et cetera, et cetera. So again, lots of biodiversity because you have different niches, right? A little drier up here, a little wetter down here, right? More salt, less salt, et cetera, et cetera, allows many more creatures, uh, creatures to evolve and to develop and to live. And so again, you have a lot of biodiversity uh, in these coastal areas uh, right along the shoreline. All right, so let's talk more about the uh, importance of these wetlands. Again, wetlands, okay? Oh, let's go back to that to talk about the importance. Our areas that are saturated with water all are part of the year. They have standing shallow water with emergent vegetation. They contain communities of plants and animals that have adapted to continuously wet conditions. Freshwater wetlands, okay? So we talked a little bit about salt water, but again, they're kind of all the same in a sense of what they do for us. Our freshwater wetlands are going to include swamps, marshes, bogs, something called fens, and, and something called prairie prairie potholes, right? Saltwater wetlands are going to include just what we talked about, the estuaries, the mangrove swamps, the coastal marshes. Uh, marshes. Again, we're going to talk more about the freshwater uh, wetlands coming up in, in just a bit, uh, basically in part two. Both provide, though, many ecosystem services. Again, I talked a lot about them. Um, so again, that's why these wetlands are just so important. In addition, uh, high areas of NPP, high biomass can support a lot of biodiversity. So when we get rid of our wetlands, our estuaries, uh, again, it's like cutting down a tropical rainforest. We're, we're destroying where most of our uh, aquatic uh, organisms or, or most of where our aquatic biodiversity uh, actually is. So we're going to finish up uh, this part, part one, by just revisiting the coral reefs. Again, the amazing centers of biodiversity that they are. They're the marine equivalent of tropical rainforest. I, I consider the coral reefs and kind of the marshes and the estuaries kind of together as the marine equivalent of the tropical rainforest because again they just have so much biodiversity in such a small little area but again reefs are being destroyed and damaged worldwide why ocean acidification as the ocean absorbs that carbon dioxide um it reacts with ocean water to form a weak acid that decreases the level of carbonate ions needed to form the coral uh and then of course that uh, along with the rising temperatures of the the ocean causes the corals to be bleached and to die out. So again, we're seeing this happen, and that's how we know um, that unfortunately uh, the carbon dioxide out there is not only destroying the atmosphere, uh, but also uh, destroying uh, the ocean aquatic ecosystems as well. All right, that concludes part one of my lecture on chapter six, aquatic uh, biodiversity. Uh, please make sure to uh, turn, tune in for part two, where we will head to the freshwater. Talk to you then, and as always, thanks for listening.